Let me invite you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is where we'll be this morning. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there is a Bible provided for you right there in the pew rack. You need to uh, open it up because my sermon this morning uh, won't make any sense if you don't have the Bible. If you're a guest with us today, this is what we normally do. We pray together, uh, then we sing together, and then we open the Bible and see what does the Bible say. Here at Hickory Grove, there is not a man or a woman that has authority. All of us stand on equal ground up under the authority of the Bible. So all of the authority, the ruling authority here at Hickory Grove is God's Word. That's why we'll stand and read it in just a second. It's why my sermon will come from the Bible, because that's where you'll find the words of life. Romans chapter 8. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Romans chapter 8. I'll take you down to verse 12, and we'll read from verse 12 to verse 17. If you're a guest with us, you've joined us right in the middle. We, We go through books of the Bible so that a sermon is a whole lot like a Bible study. We just look and see, what does the Bible say? We've been working through Romans since January, and uh, we'll, if you come back next January, we'll be working through it still, probably. But we are about halfway through the book of Romans, and we've heard all about the gospel. Now today, we hear what we are to do with the gospel. We'll start in verse 12. Grass withers and and the flowers fade, but the word of our God... Stands forever. Let's begin in verse 12. <clears throat> so then, brothers, we are debtors. Not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Well, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Join me as we pray. Father, I ask that by your spirit you will guide us into all truth. May Jesus be lifted high. May your children, all of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, be encouraged and challenged, convicted even. Father, I pray for the the man and woman, even religious and yet not saved. Awaken their hearts to believe the gospel today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May be seated. <clears throat> Responsibility. Being responsible. Responsibility is one of the foremost planks in the platform of Christian maturity. In fact, it is one of the foremost planks in the platform of normal. Maturity. If you have children, if you're a parent here today, if you have children, one of the primary ways that you gauge their growth into young adulthood is their growing acceptance of responsibility. And as you watch that, all of us are looking forward to that glorious day when they are finally off the payroll. Amen. (laughs) Responsibility. The taking upon yourself of the dealing with the issues. Responsibility is owning the wrongs. Responsibility is, is an effort to develop, to become better. 
Responsibility means never shifting the blame. Responsibility means rejecting victimhood. Responsibility is the joyful striving for a genuine sense of, of, of mental and emotional and maybe even physical health. Responsibility. Now, I've, I've said that several times this morning. Because that word responsibility is an often overlooked part of what it actually means to be a Christian. For those of us that believe that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, it is given to us by God when we believe in Jesus and what He's done when you look so hard at the good grace of God, sometimes you forget you actually have responsibility. You see, up to this point, the Apostle Paul, let's do some catch up here. Up to this point in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has spent most of his time telling us what it is that God has done for us in Jesus. And that's good news. The wonderful grace of the gospel is that Jesus lived a perfect life in the place of our sinful lives, that Jesus died on the cross, His death on the cross is there for our punishment, that His resurrection from the dead promises us a wonderful eternal future, you believe that and you're saved. So, so that's the gospel. But now here's what Paul is doing. In this little section I just read to you this morning, Paul turns for a moment away from what God has done for believers to now what is actually expected of believers. Responsibility. What are you, here's the question, now that you have the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer in Jesus, what are you, now that you have the Holy Spirit, what are you now responsible for? What is expected of you? And, and, and how do you do it when you find out what it is that is expected of you? Well, I'll give you a hint before we even get to the text. You won't be alone doing it. Woven through this entire passage, you probably saw it, this passage is about our responsibility, but woven through this entire passage is the promise of God's power in you through the filling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about the word sanctification and human effort in the process of sanctification is obviously necessary. you got to do something. But human effort is never apart from the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life. This passage right here in front of us, this passage is filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single verse, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, every single verse mentions the Holy Spirit. So as we seek to take responsibility and grow in Christ, it's good to remember that we are powered by the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about grace. We'll give the theme like this. Great grace. And remember that God's grace is great. Great grace means great responsibility. The great grace that God has given us in Jesus means that you and I have a great responsibility. You know, this passage we're going to read, this passage speaks to who you are in Christ. So let's use that identity to define our responsibility. I'll just give you two points today. Two points. Two pictures of our identity. Here's the first one. Number one, we are debtors to grace. Debtors. D-E-B-T-O-R-S. We are debtors to grace. It's right there in verses 12 and 13. Right there from the text. Let's go to verse 12 and 13. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. And let me read it. Just pretend that the, that the verse numbers are not there. And let's read it as one complete sentence because it is. And let's see what Paul means. So let's go to verse 12. <clears throat> so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh 
to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see how he does it in verse 12? He puts it in a negative light first. We are debtors not, negatively, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, here's the bad news, you're going to die. So before we get too far, let's take two words and define them. Let's take the word debtor and the word flesh. doesn't take much training to know what the word debtor is. It is to be in debt to someone, to be obligated, to be responsible, to owe to someone. Debtor. Drop down to that word flesh. The word flesh there will have sort of a dual meaning. One personally for us is that it's our natural part of who we are. The flesh is just being human. But in this context, there's a broader use of the word that Paul uses when he talks about being debtors to the flesh. The broader sense of this word is this present world and all of the cultural expectations that are put on us every single day. So with that idea, let's go back to the passage and let me just sort of paraphrase it and see if it makes sense to you as I paraphrase the passage. As a Christian, if you're a Christian today, I'm talking mostly to Christians. As a Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit, you right now have no obligation to all the cultural expectations that are put on you almost every hour of every day. You live in a world that is putting pressure on you to conform to a certain way of living and a certain way of thinking. Whether it has to do with how much money you should make or how much education you should have or your views on sexuality, what is honoring to God and what is not honoring to God in sexuality, or the world of gender confusion that we live in. Look, don't forget that we live in a world, we get used to it, but we live in a world that is in absolute rebellion against God. It's the world you live in, you go to work every day in a world that is in complete rebellion against God. And so here you come in as a Christian, it, is gonna, it should make you feel so odd. It's, it's like seeing someone that's Amish. Ever been somewhere and see an Amish man or a woman with a black hat and black suit and the, the beard cut in a way you wouldn't normally cut your beard? And you just look over there and think, that is an odd thing. They look out of place. The truth of the matter is, although we don't have black hats on and black coats on, the truth of the matter is, you ought to be that out of place in the world you live in. Because the world has circled up around you, and it can feel intimidating. You start believing the pressure you're having put on you. That's what bullies do. That's what bullies do intimidate you into doing things that they want you to do. And the promise here in this passage is that you, you aren't in debt to, the, to that world. Look, that's not what you owe. We are debtors not to the flesh. This is what Paul is telling the church that lives in Rome. They would feel this pressure immensely, just like you feel it. And he's saying, don't forget now, don't let them bully you. Don't believe that. You're not a debtor to the flesh. You're not a debtor to the world. You're not a debtor to your your own sinful desire. In fact, the the obligation is just the opposite. If you take this passage and flip it over, or if you, you read it backwards, you are debtors not to the flesh. Well, if you're not to the flesh, you must be debtors to the Spirit. You see, your obligation, I'm talking to believers here now. I'll talk to those of you that are not Christians in a moment, but let me just talk to the church Your obligation is to God the Father who saves you through Jesus the Son and He does that by filling you with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, verse 13 speaks to those that are not Christians as well. Do you see it in verse 13? Let's go there, verse 13. Paul says in verse 13, those that are not Christians, those that are not believers, those, look at it, those that live according to the flesh, they will die. That die there, it's, it's not the death we're all going to die, we're physical, one day we'll breathe our last. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about eternal, truly God-forsaken death. And the point I want to make to those of you that are not believers, I want you to hear this. You will be held accountable for the gospel you're hearing today. That God is holy, you are a sinner separated from God, Jesus lived perfectly in your place, died on the cross in the place of sinners, God raised him from the dead. If you will believe that, you'll be saved. You've just heard the gospel. You're accountable for that. And the point I'm trying to make today is I'll stop right here and I want to speak to believers. Don't, don't let sin or the culture, or your business, or school, or the people that you're with, or the pressure you put on yourself, don't let it bully you. It's a lie. You're not a, you're not a debtor to any of that. Verse 12 says, we are not debtors to the flesh. But look with me, keep looking at it. Look with me at the alternative. What do we do as believers to fight the good fight of faith? What can I do? Okay, so it's not the world that I owe anything to. What then is expected of me? Well, let's go to verse 13 and uh, finish out verse 13. Let me start it and finish it out. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Those that live according to the flesh that are not Christians, they'll die and go to hell. But, contrast, but if... By the Spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see that? You ought to circle that in your Bible. But if by the Spirit, not by yourself, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Here it is right here. Here is our obligation. Here is our struggle. Here is our life's work. You want to know what God's will for your life is? It's right there. Put to death the deeds of the body. Now, if you want an official name, those of you that like this kind of thing, uh, which, by the way, should be all of you, what do you want to call this? This is the doctrine of mortification. Mortification. If you have the King James, it probably says to mortify the body. That means to kill. The doctrine of mortification to put to death all of those old sins that are keeping you from actually growing in Christ. Here is the obligation of every Christian. Here's the responsibility that we have to, the Bible says, to put it to death, to, to resist, to flee. Jesus will say, tear it out and cut it off. To, to take the kingdom of God by spiritual violence. To struggle. Even Paul, near the end of his life, the great apostle Paul would say, I, I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to other people, I myself will be disqualified. Here it is, right? It is the epic personal struggle that every single Christian ought to be in, but so few actually really are. This, this right here, verse 13, this is you. This is you going to drastic lengths. You going to drastic lengths to kill the besetting sin that's in you. And, and, and thank God that it's not just you deciding to grit your teeth and you just having more willpower or you trying harder. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body. Now, I'm staying here for a moment because I don't know when I heard the last sermon on the mortification of sin is. 
I can tell you when. Never. We just don't hear this kind of thing very much. This is a, a neglected topic in Christianity today. But verse 13 is Paul's explanation. You've heard people say that, that Paul and Jesus should be contrasted because Paul's harder than Jesus. They're not saying the same thing. Look, that is not true. That is absolutely not true. Paul doesn't conflict Jesus. Paul explains and furthers what Jesus has said. This whole book is going to be pointing back to Jesus, including everything that the Apostle Paul said. And this little verse 13, you know what this is? It's nothing more than an explanation of what Jesus taught. Remember what Jesus said? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Look, this is, this is your life's work. To put to death the deeds of the body. To put to death every use of our bodies, our eyes and ears and our mouths and our minds and our hands and our feet. To put to death every use of our bodies that serves ourselves and doesn't serve other people or serve the Lord Jesus. And, and by the Spirit, we are responsible for this. But how? How does mortification, how do I kill that sin? How does it take place? Well, it doesn't take place by passively sitting by uh, and, and waiting on something to happen. On, on the contrary, I mean, that's how we're saved. It is God acts on us. He saves us by grace. We believe that, right? But, but once that happens, sanctification brings you into the picture. We are responsible for putting evil to death. And so what I'd like to do, I'd like to make some suggestions because I feel like so many Christians live at this sort of low-level Christianity and don't enjoy the genuine victory that is yours in Jesus. Many of these suggestions you would find in uh, the old Puritan writer John Owen. John Owen, if you want to read great Puritan theology, go read everything John Owen writes, but be warned, it is not for children. I mean, it is heavy reading. You read it and <clears throat> your, your soul will feel good, but your eyes will be crossed when you read it. He's written beautiful things on the Holy Spirit, beautiful things on fighting and killing sin. He's the one who famously said, you ought to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. I'd just like to make some suggestions. I'll go through them quickly. Remember I said I had two points? Two points. Well, this point has, I have ten sub-points in this point here. And a few for the second point. We'll go quickly here. <clears throat> Don't panic. We'll, we'll get through it. Here's the first one. You need to decide this very moment that you're going to take the initiative and responsibility. That you right now, this very moment, if you're a Christian and you've been sitting lazily by and not doing, I'm asking you now to decide this very moment that you're going to take responsibility that by God's grace and through His Spirit, you're going to stop carrying shame around. You're going to stop losing the battle. You're going to stop living with this sort of low-grade sin fever that you've been running for weeks now. And decide this moment, right now, to take the initiative. Here's the second thing. <clears throat> I want you to, in your mind, repudiate, if you know that it's wrong, repudiate everything you know to be wrong. You're, you're going to want to say it. You might want to whisper it. You might, might want to say it out loud. And then I want you to repudiate what you know to be wrong and then decide that it's your enemy and hate it. Here's the third thing. I want you to get ruthless with sin. Get ruthless with your own sin. Quit all the flirting with, with sin. Quit all the running upside the edge and wondering why you keep falling off. What is the Lord's prayer? You remember what the disciples said to Jesus? Teach us how to pray. And the Lord, He taught them how to pray. started uh, with our Father in heaven. And as He went through the prayer and provision, one of those provisions was you remember it? Lead us not into temptation, but instead, when we get close to evil, deliver us from evil. 
Get ruthless with your sin. Here's a fourth one. I want you to develop aspirations, goals that are God-honoring. What did Paul write in Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2? Paul says, if then, if then you've been raised with Christ, then seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above. Not on the things on the earth. We are to develop healthy, godly pursuits in life. Here's a fifth one. It's just like that. Fifth one. You need to occupy your thoughts. because It's so hard to do this. You need to occupy your thoughts with what is noble. You, you say, I can't help what I think. It's true you can't help what gets in there. You can help how long it stays in there. Isn't that what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? Paul writes, finally, brothers, by the way, if you're wondering if the show you're watching uh, should be watched, here's a checklist. Just take, here's your checklist. Sit down in front of it. If you're looking at something on your smartphone or an iPad or whatever screen you have, here's your checklist right here. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, then think about these things. You know what this is? Here is your participation. Here is the exercise of self-control in your own mind. And if, and if you're having trouble with your thoughts, it might be because of all of that trash you're putting in. What's coming through your eyes. I, I really think this is what Jesus had in mind in Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Sermon on the Mount. Remember what he said there? Uh, Matthew 6, verse 22 and 23, Jesus said that the eye is the lamp of the body. So picture that the lamp comes in and shines into the body, not out of. So the eye is the lamp of the body, so that your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Here's the sixth one. We, we need to admit sin for what it is. We need to call, call it what it is. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Be offensive to yourself. Not, not other people. You're already offensive enough to other, everybody else. Be offensive to, to yourself. It's much easier to call and say terrible things about somebody else and their sin. I'm asking you to turn that ruthlessness inside and be offensive to yourself. Label your own sin with raw truth. Don't equivocate that it is in fact an offense to God. Let me give you something else. To kill sin, we, we need to actually see sin for what it is. See it. What is it? Three things I'll just give you. There's a bunch of them, but here's three. Sin is going to be poison to your heart. If you let it in, it's going to poison you. Sin is poison to your heart. Sin is an absolute offense to God. Poison to your heart, offense to God. And sin, the third thing is, sin brings forth punishment. So if you're a believer, here's what I want you to picture. When you sin, go with me to the cross and see him there. See him there dying for your sins. That's what he's doing. And the wrath of God rests on Jesus in the place of sinners at the cross. But if you're not a believer, I don't want you to look yet at the cross right now. That cross is not for you. If you're not a believer, you need to just imagine the worst place you can possibly come up with. And it's a billion times worse. And you think about hell. Because sin not only is poisonous for your heart, it's not only an offense to God, it brings punishment. And either Jesus takes the punishment or you do. Here's an eighth way to think about it. I want you to imagine the worst scenario. Whatever your sin is, is some sort of offense, and, and maybe it's, it's, you don't think it's that bad. I want you to think, what is the absolute worst case scenario of this sin? And, and whatever road you might have started down with this sin, I want you to look 10 miles down the road down there. What's the outcome down there? How many hearts are going to be broken? What is the eventual outcome of it? 
Look way down the road as you start to combat sin. That's going to help, going to help you think it through. I'll give you a ninth thing to help you. It helps me fight sin. I need to be in real fellowship in a church. God saves us by the grace of God in Jesus, our faith in Jesus, and he puts us in the church. We need brothers and sisters in Jesus. We need passive and active accountability. The passive accountability of being in a congregation with some people that we don't know, but they know we should be there. They know we profess to be Christians. But the active accountability comes with brothers and sisters who've been invited in to be close and are able to speak truth to you in love and help you. It's a travesty for Christian people to stand by and watch other Christians slide off into destruction. We need to be in real fellowship. And I'll give you a tenth one. We need to confess to God all known sin every day to God. There are going to be some sins you can't remember. We sin so much, we don't even can't remember the sins we've... That doesn't mean they're not covered by the blood of Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus, those sins are atoned for at the cross. But I'm telling you that it's good for your soul to say it to God, to confess the sin, to say the same thing about it. Yes, Lord, this was sin. It's sin. I thank God that it's paid for at the cross of Jesus, but, but it was sin. You see, we've been given a great responsibility to, verse 13, put to death the sin that's in the body. Great grace means great responsibility. We are debtors to grace to kill the deeds of the body. Debtors to grace. That's, that's the first point. Let me give you the second point. I know you're looking at your watches. I'm a, I'm a fast preacher. We'll get through it. Don't panic. We'll, we'll do you some good to skip a meal here and there. We are debtors. We are debtors to grace. I'll go quickly. We are also, number two, we are children of grace. Right? We're children of grace. What a great turn and promise you find there in this text, starting in verse 14. It goes all the way down to verse 17. Let me read it to you and, and just notice the beauty of it. You're going to see some things that I don't talk about. There, there's such beauty in this passage. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, we are heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Let's walk through it quickly. I'll show you a couple of things. I want you to see, first of all, in verse 14, 15, and 16, and 17, I want you to see the progression of grace. The progression of grace. Don't forget where you came from. Verse 15, slaves, sons, heirs. Do you see the progression? We were slaves to sin. We are now sons, of, sons and daughters of God, and we inherit. This is what grace does. Grace emancipates, emancipates the slaves then takes that slave, doesn't say, okay, you're free now, do whatever you want. Takes that slave, brings it into the home place and says, look, you now are part of the family. Not only that, there's a day coming when every bit of this is now yours. It's the progression of grace. We are heirs. What does that even mean? Heirs of God and, and co-heirs with Jesus? Progression of grace. But let me show you in verse 14 the sign of grace. Look at the sign of grace in verse 14. Do you see it? The text says that those for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So if you want to take it backwards, to be a son of God means that you are led by the Spirit of God. Led by the Spirit. So the Old Testament, Moses, the Old Testament, God's law led us to Christ. We give our lives to Jesus. We're filled by the Holy Spirit. Now we are in Christ, and it's not the law 
that leads us now. Now it is the Spirit that leads us. You know what Jesus said, John 16, verse 13? Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, He will lead us. The Spirit will lead us into all truth. What does the Spirit do? There are three things you can count on when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. It will always point us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not going to take you away from Jesus. The Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. Number two, the Holy Spirit always agrees with the Bible. The Holy Spirit will never contradict anything in the Bible because the Bible is God-breathed. It is God's Holy Spirit speaking how does God speak to us? Through the Bible. So the Bible will always point us to Jesus. It will never contradict the Bible, always agrees with the Bible. And the third thing is, the Holy Spirit always leads toward holiness. Don't, don't drag up here and say, you know what, I feel like the Holy Spirit is leading me to divorce my wife. Don't come and tell me that. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's going to point you to Jesus, agree with the Bible, and lead you into holiness. That's the sign of grace. Let me show you the strength of grace. Look at the strength in verse 15. Notice what the text says. When you receive the Spirit, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You're not a slave anymore. And not only that, you're not afraid. But you have something else. Look at verse 15. You have the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters. Here, here's your strength. Your strength comes from being a child of God. You don't have to heed the, the voice of the old master. You don't belong to sin and Satan anymore. You, you've been redeemed. I'm talking to believers now. You've been redeemed and purchased and cleansed and forgiven and justified and legally adopted as an eternal member of God's family through Jesus Christ. Look, look, at, the, look at the prayer of grace. Do you see there in verse 15 the prayer of grace? For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of, of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father, Abba is the Aramaic. It's what Jesus said. Father is the Greek. To cry out, that word is to, means to call out for help. Think about Peter when he got out of the boat and walking on water and when he saw the winds and the waves and he started to sink. Remember what he said? Lord, save me. Even, even more pointedly, when you look at verse 15, here, here is... Here is Jesus on the cross. This is his prayer. This is what Jesus prayed. And now because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, you, any of you that are in Jesus, you can call out to God the Father like Jesus the Son. You see, grace has bought you that kind of praying. Look at the witness Look at the witness of grace. Verse 16. See what the text says in verse 16? The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. By the way, all throughout Romans 8, this is the only time the word Spirit is used and it's not talking about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit Himself, that's the Holy Spirit, bears witness to our spirit. So the Spirit Himself, big S, to our spirit, small s. You have two witnesses in verse 16. Which is amazing because Deuteronomy 17 tells us that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. You have two witnesses. Here Paul is telling us that being adopted as sons or daughters of God affects the deepest, innermost parts of our lives. That we know it on the deepest level of who we are. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. Look at the promise. Look at the promise of grace in verse 17. Do you even know what to do with, with that? And if children, here's the logic, if, if we're children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God? I mean, how do you even break that? For, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Look at the caveat. Don't, don't forget that part. Provided we suffer with Him, 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. Fellow heirs with Christ. So, so here's how it goes. Christian men and women inherit the blessings of God's kingdom only through and in Christ. And that glorious, that glorious inheritance described in verse 17 is obtained only through suffering. Oneness with Christ means that we follow Christ's own suffering. That's what Paul said. As we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so we are and will share abundantly in His comfort. You see, the way of glory and the way to glorify God is through the cross of Jesus. Great grace. It means great responsibility. We are debtors of grace. We, we are children of grace. And it is the grace of God given to us in Jesus. So, so if you're a Christian, be encouraged and be strengthened. If you're not a Christian, hear the word of God. Be changed by your faith in Jesus and what he has done on the cross. Will you join me now as we pray together? your heads bowed this morning, if God has spoken to your heart as a believer, you'd like to come forward and just pray and have people pray with you. When we sing, I want you to do that. To start today the, the battle with your own sin. You just have ignored it for some time and now God has spoken to you through His Word and you want to put to death. You want to be in the, you want to receive the, the mortification of sin. If God has spoken to your heart, we'll invite you to come forward. For those of you here that are religious and you believe in God and have your whole life, but you've never actually heard that you need to put your faith in Jesus, we'd like to talk to you further. Part of what we do here is at the end of every sermon, we just give you a chance to respond. We call that the invitation. It means everybody's going to be singing. We'll all be standing and singing. That's, that's the opportunity to come forward and talk to one of our trained leaders or one of our pastors about you giving your life to Jesus Christ. If God has spoken to your heart today, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, we do thank you for the grace you've given us in Jesus. And I pray that you give us strength, that we as debtors of grace and children of grace would live in a way that honors your name, gives glory to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together?